You're watching WRKM Channel 22, number one in the region. No burp. I thought I was gonna. I thought I was gonna burp. Good evening. It's still a possibility I could burp. We'll find out. <laughs> I'm Rafael Martinez, and this went in darkness. Um, how's your week been? My week was okay. It wasn't anything to brag about. Last week we talked about um the payphones being removed, which was great, fantastic stuff. Um. City already feels safer. I see less crackheads already and less pimps. If things didn't stay great, they did not stay great. This past week, I I lost my favorite breakfast burger. And when you're my weight, you know, you get to have those things. That's what they don't tell you about getting bigger. You start developing new favorite things. And you're allowed to have them because you're that size. It's a plus body privilege, I think. I get to have favorite breakfast burgers. You don't if you're skinny. You have a favorite leaf. You can have favorite salad. But you get to enjoy breakfast burgers like I do. Is because the bodega that, you know, normally made it decided to remove its grill and replace it with pop products. The burgers are out. The Zaza is in. Not much you can do about it. Damn shame. If you had told me legalization was going to lead to this, I would... I would have told you, sir, you can keep it. Weed has ruined my life. And I, and I wonder about the kids who now go to that grocery store. It looks like a nightclub, so they're already confused. Now they'll be able to buy a, a bag of Swedish fish with an eighth of grape ape at eight. Not good. Not good. I'm not surprised by it, though. More and more bodegas are getting into the weed game. Bodegas were always kind of like an international waters on land kind of deal. There's probably a name for that, but I'm too stupid to know it. There's a group of guys around. One's in charge, and all the rules are flexible. Just do what the captain says. That's the bodega. And I can make a international waters immigrant banana boat joke because I'm Puerto Rican. And I can do that. So before anyone gets upset, I can do that. Bodegas in my neighborhood weren't bad. There's always this one Spanish guy dancing around. Ever been to Bodega in Coney Island? It's a clown doing heroin in the corner. An over-the-hill belly dancer 
dancing for dollars with the storekeeper. That's how she pays the rent. Gets milk for her child. But that wasn't all sad, though. The bodega did get rid of its payphone, so I felt happy about that. But it's too much now. The access, the accessibleness of drugs. They used to be fun. It used to be fun when you couldn't get your hands on them. When you did, you appreciated it more. Speaking from other people's experiences, not mine. Don't do dope, kids. But it used to be fun. When you weren't supposed to have it. Now it's too accepted, I feel. It's lost all its edge. But the grocery store just taking my grill away, just sad. Because it's a bad business move. Wouldn't you want to do both? They're like locked in together. You can't lose. Now I don't know the dimensions of the bodega really. I never look, really look behind the counter. This is that big, you know, thing where all the meats are. I can't really see behind that. I don't know what's going on back there. But it had to have been at least room for a George Foreman grill. These guys not doing it right. Bad business moves by the bodega. And, you know, it. we always knew the bodega was a front. But now it's not the front's in front. Let's go buy a Nesquik full menu of Zaza. Not happy about it. Not happy about it one bit. I want my breakfast burger back. It's the only thing that matters to me now. In these hard times of inflation, my breakfast burger. I saw the movie Men. Uh, that was rough. I don't hate the movie Men. To be honest, I'm going to probably speak about it very spoilery. So if you haven't seen it. Ouch. I never thought watching a man give birth to another man would be so funny to watch. It was kind of the funniest thing I ever seen. And like they were born in different ways. Some went feet first. Some went head first. I think I know what men's about. I mean, from a plot standpoint. Woman goes to a cottage. Keeps seeing old dudes who look like the same dude. Then they all do, you know, microaggressions throughout the movie that turn into actual aggressions. And then, you know, weird shit starts to happen. Like men giving birth to men. It's not a bad movie. I don't know if it's good either. Can't say I enjoyed it. But I can't say I hate it. But men gave birth to men. That's all I really got. That's all I really got. Because here's the thing. This woman was getting a divorce from an abusive husband. He hit her. Spoiler for the next, I don't know how many minutes. He hit her. He apologized. She said, fuck off. Getting divorced anyway. Kicked him out the apartment. Said you'll never see me again. He made it clear if you do this, I'll kill myself. And she went, no, you can't do that. Cause that's abuse. Can't tell people that. And she's right. You can't. 
So it's, le- it's left to a little bit of mystery of did he kill himself or did he not kill himself? He definitely fell and he's definitely dead. But no one knows if it was on purpose or not. So he's living with that guilt. And all the men in his town, who all like Rory Kinnear, are just kind of being a dick to her. And eventually they start trying to attack her. And have their way with her. She eventually stabs one of them. Because you find out they're all one person. And then, in reaction to the stabbing, men start birthing men. And then, one final man births into her ex-husband. And she finally asks him, what do you want? And he's like, your love. And she's like, the end. Now that's being unfair to Alex Garland, to be fair. A lot of subtext was in there. I don't know if it was breaking new ground. There was a naked man who was on her property. She called the cops. Girl cop was really cool. Guy cop was kind of dismissive. Guy cop says, well, he didn't try to attack you or anything. Wasn't violent. So we let him go. She's like, are you fucking serious? He's on my fucking, ter- you know, my fucking territory. My land. I kind of feel unsafe. He was stalking me. Well, you didn't say he was stalking you. Are you, are you fucking carrying me? So there's stuff like that. There's stuff like the really friendly landlord who's toxically, positively nice. But a second, you know. Well, I mean, in, the, in, his, in his defense. At one point, she didn't run him over with a car. Because she was scared to death. Believe me, you don't need to know this movie in order. Truly, you don't. You can put it any way you want. still wouldn't matter. Because in essence, it just makes the same argument everyone else is making. Actually, it doesn't make any argument. I'm, I'm actually being too kind to it. It just kind of, quote unquote, starts a conversation, whatever that means. That's why we live in movies now. Everyone's afraid to make a point. They want to start conversations. Okay. Okay, we're starting conversations. Cool. We have no answers. We have no suggestions. Just having conversations. Just seems a little lazy. It shot well. But the men birthing men part, you know, I just... It, it couldn't have looked real, but they did their best. The graphics were nice. He never screws up with that. Well, the kid that was supposed to be Rory Kinnear as a kid didn't look great, but he spent all his money on the men birthing men. Why were men birthing men? Well, apparently Rory Kinnear is some kind of magical fuck who can do that shit. And that's also, you know, to be fair, an allegory. If men could birth men, they would build imperfect people. Because they got more disfigured as he went along. But still, you know, felt kind of on the nose the entire movie. You know, maybe Alice Garland just got tired of subtlety and just said, fuck it. Let's just do it. Let's show it to him. And he did. Kudos to him. Because I never thought I'd seen men birthing men before. But boy, I saw it. Should you see it? Maybe. I can't tell you that. No one can be told what men is, really. You have to experience it for yourself. I'll tell you straight up, Top Gun was fire. I won't spoil it. I won't spoil Top Gun. It's crazy. I I spoiled the art piece, but I don't spoil the blockbuster because the blockbuster is fun. I'll tell you this: Tom Cruise may be the greatest actor of our time. I know, I know. Hot take. But think about it: Is Daniel Day Lewis gonna fly a jet for a role? I think not. 
Ever since Gangs in New York, he's been really phoning it in with that voice. Matter of fact, no, ever since There Will Be Blood, he's been phoning it in. He's been Daniel Plainview a lot. Which is no offense to Daniel Day-Lewis, great role. But come on. Do a different voice. But no, Tom Cruise does it. For real. He flies helicopters. He launches himself off, you know, cliffs and motorcycles. All for the enjoyment of us. In the beautiful, beautiful action cinema he creates. And is Top Gun Maverick corny? Kind of. It was the right kind of corny. They did something in it that I thought was interesting. And this is not really a spoiler, but they don't really say who the enemy is. They just call him the enemy. Very vague. Everyone's taking their guess. Some say Iran. I say Russia. But they were very vague about it, which I, I kind of like. You know, let's not offend anybody. Let's just make it a rogue nation state that's doing some wild shit. We don't want to name them because it's classified. But it is a competition movie, but it has a mission, which is nice. You know, you know, Val Kilmer's in this movie. You know, he can't talk anymore. You know, he's had, I think he had the surgery for the cancer. You know, they brought him back. And it wasn't just the technology of the aerial maneuvers that were so great, you know, with jets and all that. And this is not even a spoiler, because he actually... This is part of the press for the movie. But they found a way to bring back Val Kilmer's voice. Where that he could speak into something that had kind of like a... They had taken an AI that studied his voice. You know, from all his roles. And they were able to create like a close to accurate voice of what his voice would sound like. You know, with the cancer and all that. And it's for a really pivotal scene. You know, it's amazing. What technologically we can do now. But yes, Tom Cruise is the greatest movie, movie star of all time. I can't, I can't. It's done. He's going to space. For cinema. No one has given his body more for cinema. Except for Jackie Chan. But I think, I think Jackie Chan has the better broken bones. But I don't know if he has like the better stunts though. Because did Jackie Chan fly a helicopter? Might need more research. I don't think he has. Tom Cruise has, though. And that's what makes him great. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, part one and two. That should be fine. But damn Top Gun Maverick. That movie has moments where you're like, that goddamn Maverick, you know? Can you feel good? It felt like the 80s were back for a little bit. Like, I was like, damn, America is kind of cool. We do have fucking cool Navy pilots. I kind of want to go to Top Gun, but I'm too old. My call sign would be Fats. And no one wants to fly with Fats. He weighs down your jet. Tom Cruise never picked me for the mission. Val Kimmer wouldn't even let me into the Navy. But that's why you live vicariously to movies like Top Gun. It was good to be a bro movie again. You know, bros being bros. Even though there were some women in the movie who did good jobs. Jennifer Connelly was fantastic, as always. People were saying, why wasn't the original lady in there? And I'm like, to be honest with you, she's a bit older than him in the first movie. They kind of like don't outright say it, but it's explained she might be a little bit older than him. So, yeah, she might look old appropriate, but this is is fucking Top Gun, bro. Like, who's got time for that? You know, like, call me shallow, bro, but this is Top Gun, bro. Everyone's gonna have a rocking body. You know, they have a scene just like the um, volleyball scene in the original Top Gun. Let me tell you. Hot bodies. Everyone looking good. Jennifer Connelly looking great. Better with age. I like her better with age. I think there's something... There's something beautiful in watching her mature 
like as a woman, like to that later stage, like there's, there's, you start to really realize how undeniably beautiful she's always been. That's like classic. I, I put it up against anybody. There are very few who can go toe to toe with Jennifer Connelly, and she's only getting better. Sorry. Like you see, like how she was set up to win in life genetically. But she's really good in this movie. It's good to be at a bro movie again. Because there's some, like, Forrest Ferrari does it. You know, it talks about bro y things of, like, guys, we may not communicate the way people think we should, but we do have our own ways of expressing, you know, emotion. These little things that no one really pays attention to that only you and I both know, you know, between your homies. It's really good. I max it if you can. Lady Gaga has a song in it. It's not bad. I didn't really hear it in the movie. I heard it like on the radio later, but it was pretty good. It was at the end. And at the, by the end of that movie, I was just too busy. Top Gun out, bro. <laughs> but the beauty about that movie and it's in the trailer is that Tom is living the moment. You know, Mavericks kind of past his prime. You know, what does he have left to give to the next generation? It's a tough question for a guy like Tom, who's been going at it for years. Like, he's in mid-50s now, I think. He's not going to be able to do this when he's 60. And if he's still doing this when he's 60, that Scientology shit might have a point. It might. I might join. If Tom is at 60 doing shit like this, I'll give L. Ron Hubbard my body. I'll give him my life. I wanna, I wanna have that kind of ability. Tom Cruise, he's fighting alien spirits, bro. And Top Gun, you know, it's like, come on. He's got like the best life in the world. He plays superheroes and is a superhero in real life. Whether you want to believe in that kayfabe or not. I love me a good kayfabe. But he's not the only one, you know, dealing with his age, looking back, you know, wondering what does he have left to give to the next generation. You know, young upstarts are always going after the old lion. That's just how it is. It's part of life. You know, we're witnessing it in, in wrestling right now. You probably weren't expecting this to happen, but it's happening. Um, so... Where do I begin? We originally had a very different segment that was supposed to happen here. Um, Wednesday night, uh, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, look at me trying to be all modest with my blanket. Um, Maxwell Jacob Friedman cut an amazing promo, one of the best you know work shoot promos ever. He Shit on his boss. He, you know, he shit on the direction of the company. It was great. Um, during the commercial break, CM Punk comes out to confront him. He runs away. So naturally, us being huge pro wrestling fans and loving to shoot promo, we had built an entire episode starting Wednesday night um, to be recorded Friday um, around that. The similarities of MJF and CM Punk what both of their work shoot promos in their career, because that's what CM Punk is famous for, a work shoot promo he gave um, in 2011. So we were going to compare, contrast the careers, the ideology. All It was going to be a really great segment um, in our way of helping build up to this match. You know, Then Friday came, and we're in the middle of production, and CM Punk announces he's injured, so he will be on the shelf for a few months leaving kind of in limbo whatever's going to happen between him and MJF. And there's already speculation running rampant about whether MJF will be back or not. Some people think backstage is a work. I agree with them. It's definitely a work, but it definitely started real at some point. He was disgruntled at the company. But Friday night kind of just threw us for a loop um, and kind of made the segment itself a little irrelevant 
now. So what I am going to do is I still want to do it because I still think philosophically it's an interesting piece of pro wrestling. But it's going to take some time to rework. So we also didn't want to miss deadline on the episodes. You know, we don't we don't like to be late with them. Um, so we, we try to do the best we can to be on time with them um, within the Saturday you know, realm. If you've noticed, you've actually gotten them earlier on Saturdays than later recently. That's just because we have it in the can. It's just a lot easier to put up. But um, our goal is always to hit our Saturday mark. And we just did not have an episode that I felt would work under the circumstances. And as you'll see from the first half of this episode, maybe some of that wasn't working either. Who knows? Who knows? Yes, I have bedhead. Look at me. My hair is a mess. This is what it looks like to be a sad podcaster. You're laying in your bed thinking about this cool segment you put together with cool videos and cool audio. And you know what happens? It all goes to goddamn hell. This is the reality, people. I'm not hiding it anymore. WRKM needs to know. This is what my life is like. The hustles of a week-to-week podcast, man. But it does kind of remind you about the randomness of the world. Like you, Best laid plans don't mean jack shit. And that's kind of... It, it kind of makes you laugh. Like, you know, like I used to be somebody who would take these kind of things really hard and be upset and be like, oh, man, like, why is this happening to me? But the truth is, it's not just happening to me. You know, it's happening to everybody. You know, I can't imagine how many, you know, pundits, you know, were writing these big pieces about what the MJF CM Punk feud's going to be. And now there's shit out of luck. And now we're all responding to a CM Punk injury, which I want to point something out. I'm not mad at CM Punk getting injured. I want to make that clear. I'm not being heartless about it either. CM Punk is one of my top three favorite wrestlers of all time. I love him to death. He represents so much to me. I've said it plenty of times on this show how much he means to me. But, you know, well, actually there's no but. This, you know, could not have come as a, at a worse time. Not for me or not for anyone else, but for CM Punk. This dude was gone for seven years, came back, got the ring rust off, and was having a good time again. In an industry, he swore off, and that he walked away. And it was so painful to watch um, Friday night on AEW Rampage when he announced that he was injured. You see the tears in his eyes because he found the love again, love again, and to have that love taken from him a little bit. But I know he's going to come back better than ever. Like, that's a guy who's hugely determined one of my favorite things he ever said in pro wrestling was about being from chicago and why they call it the second city he's like they call it the second city because you know when the chicago fires happened we just built a new city on top of that and with a man who comes from a city with that kind of ethos you can't count him out at all so you know we wish him the best of luck man like it, it was painful to see him you know, how he was the champion at AEW. He really was about to start the run that I think would have shut up a lot of naysayers about was he a top guy, was he a top draw, you know. He was about to prove so many people wrong, but I think he will in the future, and I think, you know, the, these moments happen in the chaos of life and I say chaos of life, I feel like that's a good middle ground between people who are religious and people who aren't religious. We can all agree life can be chaotic. When something like this is thrown at you, you can only do one of two things. Either you can bitch about it or get over it. And CM Punk is not bitching about it. He's going to get to work. He's going to come back stronger. Best believe like he's going to have his little times where he's sad and he's like struggling you know, to get through a lot of those um, physical therapies, because apparently it's one of his legs. I think it's one of his knees. That's a hard one. The knee is always hard. Guys don't come back from that normally, but he'll be fine. Like, I think he's a smart enough guy that whatever limitations he ends up having, because he's a bit of an older guy, you know, he's like, well, not really older. I mean, let's be honest, like, he's probably, like, early 40s. So, like, it, it's fucked up to say he's an older guy because 
been back in the day that was an older guy, but now it's not an older guy at all. I consider an older guy 60, real old guy 70, 80. But um, it's going to be hard for him to recover, but he's going to come back, you know. And he's going to do well. But yeah, you know, instead of having this, you know, episode end abruptly, let's just tell you what happened, you know. And normally, these would this kind of would ruin my weekend normally. Because I, I really want to make this show as best as I can. I really want to put a lot of effort into it. You know, hence the black and white right now. We couldn't give you the full studio, so we went, let's go... You know, French New Wave with it. Maybe they'll appreciate it. (laughs) But, um, you know, these kind of things, you know, they happen. And when they're outside of your control, you just want to let go. And this is not necessarily because I've had several moments like these, but other things we want to do on a show with less, you know, like it wasn't someone that got injured or anything like that. It was... Just life stuff happened. We weren't able to do the 100% potential of an idea. And sometimes you're limited. You're limited in time. You're limited in money. You're limited in just so much that you have to make do with what you got. And you end up in a DIY headspace, you know. So, yeah, but, you know, you start to handle it better. You know, I'm saying you know a lot, but it's true. I think I've gotten more mature in that way. Now one would say is this mature? Laying in your bed with a microphone in your hand? Looking all saddams? That your favorite wrestler is injured? Well, maybe that's not that mature. But he means the world to me. Talismans. Heroes. Icons. We have them. He's one of the gods in my religion. If you think about it, like we're all people. We all have our own thoughts and feelings. We all have our own gospels we live by. You know, whether you choose to base yours on Christianity or whatever, all good. But as you grow up through life, you build up your own ideology, and that's what you end up passing down. You know, the way the best genes are passed down the best memes are passed down, meme in the original sense, you know, of a, of a thought that goes through time, not like a funny picture. So you develop these memes, and um, he's a meme for me. You know, he's someone I hope to show my child someday. This is a guy who achieved so much with so little, and people doubted him, but he did it. I want that kind I want that meme to be thought of of myself. So I try my best. Do what I can creatively. That's all you can do in the end. Pass down the best memes and ensure that the meme of yourself that gets passed down is something you're proud of. So yeah, this is a bit of a odd episode. Episode forty five, you know. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Numbers Invisible by Five. So I always, you know, I, I really want this one to be great, but it is what it is. It also showed some um, flaws in our production game, you know. What necessarily my talent is on this, what it isn't. It's actually changed some things for future episodes. So, you know, you, 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 you can't get downums. I don't even know if that's a word. Or Saddam's. I don't even know if that's a word. That's definitely Saddam Hussein's name, Saddam. But you can't get too sad about it. Because you learn things. And I learned so much um, in the past 72 hours um, about myself. And about the production of this show. And what's capable and what's not capable just yet. But I am excited now. Knowing this information and going forward with the other episodes. I think... And, you know, let's bring you behind the curtain a little bit. Maybe we do, like, a ha- like instead of full-hour breakdowns of certain topics I want to do, maybe I break them up into half-hour chunks spread out across, across episodes. You know, particularly with some of the more 
big, heavier topics like we want about the American Deep State, how that was founded. You know, we want to about CIA projects that don't normally get talked about. Instead of just doing a hardcore episode, just only that, sprinkle it around, you know. Which was the original idea of this show before we got into a more free form space. But I think now we're getting to a place where we're finding the middle ground between the two. And you're here for that. And you're here for that growth. You've been with me since episode one. That technically you can't watch anymore. For another year or two. I promise you we'll explain it someday. We, we probably won't. We'll allude to it. We'll have a wink and I'm sorry. It's just, it just what it is what it is. I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> but um, yeah. You, you do what you can. With what you got. And I'm still very much proud of the 44 episodes we've done so far. You know, it's interesting. People will always tell you how they would do it, you know, if they, you know, took the time to do it. They always try to downplay what you're attempting to do. But the truth is, do they have 44 hours of content? I don't think so. I do. Whether it's seen by millions of people or it's seen by two people, the act of creating is the reps. You know, it's one of the things that I realized with going back to open mics now, having done this for so long, 44 hours of just silence by yourself, Listen, man, well, no, John was here for the first 32, but even with that, you know, John would not laugh unless something was really funny, and it'd be, it'd be hard to crack him, too. It would take forever. But when I got him, I got him good. But, um, but you, I, I've been prepared for it, you know? The same way CM Punk left for seven years, I left stand-up for ten. I mean, we talked about a little bit on the point five episode. I didn't want to get too high and mighty on it. Not necessarily high and mighty or super introspective about it, but it felt like being home again. It don't it felt like I hadn't left. The only thing was I did make a rookie mistake of going too fast. But that was something I did from time to time. I couldn't help it. There was always going to be one bad set. Even if I had like 10 good ones, there was one bad one coming. And it's going to be my fault, not the audience's fault. I couldn't help that. I think that's my subconscious telling me this stuff to work on. Don't get too crazy about it. My hair is getting ridiculous. More and more as I try to comb it to make it look nicer for you people. But, hey, man, welcome to my bed. This is me hanging out my bed. But, um, yeah. So, very much proud of what we've done here so far. And we're always improving. I'm, o- I'm always figuring out new things. You know, I just, the time, time is such a, a tough aspect of it. You know, when, when your day is... You know, anything is any employee. When your work takes a lot out of you, it's kind of hard to get to the creative stuff. So I'm doing the best I can to get on that. Um, goal is to not be tired after work. That's impossible, really. But you have to push through the tired to get what you want. Sleep later, you know? Don't be a bitch. Make it happen. And that's where I'm at now in my life. I'm doing that. Um, more confident in this now than I was a few episodes before. I'm more confident in myself than I was last year and the year you know before that. You know, I'm very comfortable with who I am. And I'm fine with who I am. I think that's what comes across. Um, I hope. But uh, yeah. What can you do? 
like I said before, nothing stops this train. Nothing stops this train. And future episodes will be better. You know, there's so much I want to do. There's so many people we want to have on. And believe me, we're going to start having people on. Um, Because while, yes, this, you know, place is kind of a way to get my stuff off my stuff out, my fears, my thoughts, my philosophies, my life has been so informed by so many great people. So I would like for you to meet them as well so they can maybe inform you on some great things. But yeah. You know, you just, you just gotta know when to fold, know when to hold them, know when to walk away, no when to run. And maybe this moment is the time to run. Well, sorry for the weird episode. But you have to give it to me. I still put out something. It was going to be a good segment, too. I'm sorry. And now this is the part where I loop myself in. It was going to be a good one, you know. But um, there'll be plenty more. Plenty more. You know, when CM Punk came back to AEW, it was around the time I started this podcast. And, you know, seeing that love he had for pro wrestling again. And how angry he was at getting injured. I relate to it. You know, there was... It took me a a bit to really think about it. I hadn't really thought about um, going to the open mic in a bit. It's been about two weeks since that um, encounter or event. Since that one happened. Hadn't taken time to really think about it. I'm just now thinking about it. And, you know, you re- I realized how much I missed it. And then you get a little angry. I so said, why didn't you do it for so long? What broke you and what kept you from it? And I still haven't really figured that, that out. There are several variables. And they were all coming together at once. But um, I, uh, I think I have to figure that out. And then everything else will come together. Because goddamn, I love this. I think all I ever really wanted was this microphone. Not his exact microphone, but you know what I mean. But yeah. We're going to make the most of it. And I think we all know how this one is going to end. 